Veronica, please feel free to begin whenever. Thank you, Jennifer. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Veronica Shillette. I'm a program director in the National Cancer Institute's Healthcare Delivery Research Program. And I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining today's healthcare team cyber discussion. Today's presentation is the second in our three part series on examining the emerging trends of diagnostic and treatment delays and decreasing adherence to care due to financial hardship. And with the enormous job loss due to COVID-19 that is contributing to the additional delays in cancer screening and treatment, we believe that information in this series is very relevant to real-time clinical practice. Whether you're a practicing clinician or a researcher, we hope our spotlight on how cancer care teams are helping patients adhere to treatment by minimizing financial hardship to be able to stimulate some ideas in your areas of work. We hope that you were able to read the two background articles that we sent on the expansion of oncology care coordination models uh, that were used to help uh, reduce hospitalization and emergency department utilization. And for today's session, we are very happy and excited to host Dr. Maggie Ling from the University of Alabama. Dr. Ling will be discussing the importance of the oncology care model and how helpful it has been in reducing patient costs. We will also be describing the financial counseling process within an oncology care model practice site. To be discussing research findings from a pilot intervention study and the impact of adding a financial counselor to the cancer care team. So, a few housekeeping items as always um, before we get started with our presentation. Uh, to prevent background noise, everyone was muted upon entry into uh, the webinar. If questions come to mind during the presentation, feel free to type them into the Q&A panel or the chat box and press send, and we're going to be uh, reading your questions during the Q&A timeframe. Um, you can also select the raised hand icon found under the participant panel, and we will unmute your line if you'd like for everyone to hear your question. Also, if you have questions uh, for me, uh, you can be able to reach me at hctcyberdiscussions at nih.gov if you have any questions this webinar or any time after this presentation. Also, we will be uh, using uh, Mentimeter um, to get some feedback um, from our participants. Um, and you will be able to go to menti.com and the code will be 4803-80. And you can ask menti.com, access menti.com. Um, using any device, device that you would use to access the internet. Okay, so one of our first questions that we're going to ask for our poll is to find out who's on the call. Again, go to menti.com and the access code is 480380. We'll wait for a few more seconds for um, the responses to populate. Okay, it looks like we have more researchers on the call, followed by uh, clinicians. We have one healthcare administrator and one other. Thank you so much for um, responding to our first call. Um, for our poll, and um, we hope everyone will enjoy today's presentation. Okay. Now I would like to introduce our featured presenter, Dr. Margaret Liang. She's a gynecologic oncologist and health services researcher at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. She grew up in Ohio and completed her undergraduate medical and residency training at the Ohio State University. She then went on to complete her fellowship training in gynecologic oncology at UCLA and Cedars Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. During that time, she earned her master's degree in science of public health. She's currently a K 12 scholar studying financial toxic toxicity in gynecologic cancer patients with the goal of developing interventions to decrease financial distress in cancer patients. Dr. Lang, thank you so much for leading today's healthcare team cyber discussion. We are so happy to have you share your research on team-based interventions 
used to reduce patient costs. And I'll turn the session over to you now. Thanks, Veronica, for that introduction and for having me here today. All right, so I have no disclosures. Um, some of this data was presented as a poster at the 2019 ASCO Quality Symposium. So it's very exciting that the NCI Division of Cancer Control and Population Sciences has undertaken this series of webinars. The goal for today's presentation is to share our experience adding a financial counselor to the care team at the O'Neill Conference of Cancer Center at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. To achieve this, we will focus on the obje objectives that are listed here. So our first objective will be to describe challenges in cancer care delivery related to addressing patient financial burden. There are many factors that contribute to patient financial burden. At a high level, it's well known that the cost of cancer care is increasing which is due in large part to the costs associated with innovations such as advanced imaging, novel therapies, and supportive agents. Unfortunately, there is a lack of transparency of healthcare costs, particularly at the patient and provider level. The complexities of insurance coverage have also made estimating patient out-of-pocket costs difficult. With the trend toward increased patient cost sharing, the unpredictability of delayed bills, and differences in coverage between medical versus pharmaceutical benefits, it's really not surprising that patients need assistance navigating their costs of cancer care. Furthermore, there are non-medical costs that are necessary for cancer care and include transportation, lodging, as well as patient and caregiver time. Cancer care can also have a significant impact on patients and their caregiver's employment and the ability for these individuals to maintain their income. Together, this financial burden can lead to decreased adherence to treatment, worse quality of life, and even bankruptcy, which has been associated with worse cancer mortality. To address these challenges, financial navigation is a critical service for healthcare practices and systems to develop in order to ensure the delivery of high quality cancer care. The NCI defines financial navigation as processes by which patients and families are aided in affording care after a cancer diagnosis to avoid financial consequences and hardship associated with cancer treatment, including education about and assistance with accessing appropriate financial programs and services. Recently, the NCI Division of Cancer Control and Population Service Services um, conducted a survey of 57 NCI-designated cancer centers. While 95% of the cancer centers had a system in place to identify patients experiencing financial hardship due to medical care costs, there was wide variability in the types of services that were provided. Moreover, 46% of respondents strongly agreed with the statement that the pathways or workflows to connect cancer patients with existing financial services were unclear at their cancer center. In the next webinar of this series in August, Dr. Janet Damore will be presenting further details from this important survey. Now, I'd like to provide you the context of our health system at the O'Neill Conference of the only NCI designated comprehensive cancer center in a four state area that encompasses Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Arkansas. There are 400 clinicians and scientists on staff, and we treat approximately 20,000 cancer patients per year, which includes 5,000 new cancer patients annually. On the right, I've circled Alabama on the two maps of the United States. At the top, warmer colors like red represent higher cancer incidence per 100,000 people. And at the bottom, warmer colors represent higher cancer mortality per 100,000 people. Situated in the southeastern United States, a region characterized by low socioeconomic status, virality, and scarcity of medical resources, you can see that we serve an area of the country with high cancer incidence and mortality. Given the national shift toward value-based payment models, our cancer center chose to participate in the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services Oncology Care Model, or OCM for short. This program is a five-year demonstration project that started in July 2016 and runs through June of 2021. The goal of this model is to achieve better health, improved care, and smarter spending for individuals with cancer who receive chemotherapy 
through appropriate al appropriately aligned financial incentives and practice redesign activities. In brief, OCM participants receive usual fee-for-service payments and then an additional two-part payment system for the care of eligible OCM beneficiaries who are undergoing chemotherapy treatment for cancer. The first of these additional payments is a monthly enhanced oncology services payment of $160 per patient episode to support management and coordination of care. And the second is a potential performance-based payment to further incentivize lowering total costs while maintaining quality care. Listed here are the major OCM practice requirements. The OCM team at O'Neill Comprehensive Cancer Center felt that adding a financial counselor to the care team was a valuable asset that would meet a need for our patients. In addition, this practice redesign activity met several of the practice requirements, which I've highlighted in bold. First, we would use data to inform continuous quality improvement of the financial counselor initiative. We knew that the responsibilities and clinical workflow for the financial counselor would likely evolve over time based on this data. Second, we plan to provide patients with estimates of the out-of-pocket costs for chemotherapy. This is one of the recommended components of a comprehensive care plan that is outlined by the Institute of Medicine. Third, the financial counselor would provide financial navigation that would complement the other navigation services that were also being put into place. Our second objective today will be to summarize strategies to optimize financial navigation. First, I'd like to pull the audience. Which of the following do you think is the most important to optimize financial navigation services? Options include increasing referrals to a financial counselor, social worker, navigator, et cetera. Another option would be providing patient cost estimates, screening all patients for financial distress, maximizing the use of available financial assistance programs, or assisting patients with their health insurance benefits. As a reminder to our attendees, um, please visit the menti.com and then the code is 480380. All right, so we can see the majority of responses so far are, as far as being the most important, is screening all patients for financial distress closely by maximizing available financial assistance programs and increasing referrals um, to relevant healthcare team members such as the financial counselor. And I think this response um, points to something we'll talk about that really identifying which patients are most in need for these services is really an important first step. Thank you for your responses. So from an organizational standpoint, I like to think of four key components of financial navigation. So identifi identification of patients with financial needs, promoting cost discussion, and maximizing available financial resources for medical costs, but also for non-medical costs that are still directly related to cancer care. And we'll talk about each of these individually. There are several potential strategies to identify patients with financial needs. The first is patient self-referral, in which a patient identifies a need and asks the healthcare team for assistance. Unfortunately, this may miss patients who do not feel comfortable bringing up these concerns with their care team or may not recognize a financial issue until they are in crisis mode. The second is healthcare team referral, in which a team member identifies a patient. This may often be due to social factors such as observing a lack of support, non-compliance with treatment or transportation difficulties, which may indicate a broader need for financial navigation services. These strategies are likely both utilized widely in current oncology practices. The following two strategies, risk stratification and universal financial distress screening, are more proactive approaches to identifying patients with financial needs. Risk stratification includes utilizing risk factors, which could include younger age, lower income, receipt of multimodal cancer therapy, or insurance automatically refer patients to a financial counselor. 
Universal financial distress screening refers to the use of screening questions or patient reported outcome measures to identify patients experiencing financial distress. Currently, the NCCN distress thermometer is a commonly used screening tool. Questions more specific to financial distress include the 11 item comprehensive score for financial toxicity and questions such as, do you have any difficulty paying for your medications? Or in the last 12 months, have you found that your income does not quite cover your living costs? In terms of promoting discussion of costs, it is important that patients are provided a reliable point of contact for cost questions and patient education materials. In a study that was conducted at our institution, Dr. Maria Pisu's research team interviewed breast cancer survivors about cost of care discussions. Some participants indicated they may not be ready to discuss costs at the time of diagnosis because they are overwhelmed, whereas others would appreciate this information up front to be able to plan or budget. Routinely reviewing insurance benefits also provides an additional opportunity to educate patients and for them to bring up cost concerns. Finally, the Institute of Medicine recommends that all cancer patients provided an out-of-pocket cost estimate. As we discussed previously, there are several barriers, including lack of transparency and the complexity of insurance coverage, to providers and or health systems being able to easily provide this information to patients. I'll share with you our initial efforts later in this talk. The next two components involve maximizing financial resources. For medical costs, financial assistance programs include internal assistance programs, which are usually hospital-based, external assistance programs, external foundations or pharmaceutical manufacturers. This can even include manufacturers supplying free drug for qualifying patients. Finally, insurance benefits may be optimized by adding or modifying patients' current insurance coverage. For non-medical costs, such as transportation and lodging, there are similarly internal and external assistance programs. In addition, this category would also include providing support for patient and caregiver employment concerns related to applying for disability or utilizing the Family Medical Leave Act benefits. Our third objective is to reinforce the role of the financial counselor as a member of the patient's care team. So I'd like to pull the audience here. What is the most important characteristic for a financial counselor? Options include knowledge of billing, knowledge of insurance benefits, knowledge of institutional workflow, knowledge of cancer treatment course, or personal skills, for instance, being organized and respectful. Thank you to those who have responded. It looks like uh, so far the majority are responding knowledge of insurance benefits. Clearly is its own um, set of terminology that can be really important, um, followed by personal skills and then a little bit of knowledge of billing. Thank you for those of you who have responded. Here is a summary of the essential duties and responsibilities that we re included in the original job posting once we decided, decided to hire a financial counselor for our oncology care model program. So the basic responsibilities included identifying patients with financial needs, providing patients with information about their insurance coverage and financial obligations, which is what a lot of the audience members um, responded to the last question, and helping patients to develop payment plans or to access patient assistance programs as necessary. I've also highlighted three other key takeaway points from this document on the left. So the first, that it is not only important for the financial counselor to have the tools to identify insured patients, but they also need to be able to identify underinsured patients. So this may include patients with a high deductible health plan or Medicare without a supplemental insurance plan. Also, there may be risk stratification tools that can identify patients financial needs, such as identifying those with pending account balances within the hospital billing system. 
Second, the financial counselor really does operate as a member of the entire healthcare team. As such, there needs to be appropriate workflows in place for streamlined and timely interdepartmental communication, which includes collaboration with infusion therapy, patient access services, and financial services, as well as really specific healthcare team members, which can include healthcare providers, social workers, navigators, and pharmacists. Third, it is important to have tracking systems in place to provide regular follow-up with patients to ensure resolution of previously identified financial needs and to check in as new financial concerns may develop later in the treatment course. we hired our financial counselor, we set out to provide training through reading material, online modules, and in-person shadowing. From a knowledge-based perspective, it was important for our financial counselor to have an understanding of the general cancer treatment course, insurance benefits, and billing. It was helpful for us that our financial counselor had previous work experience in the billing office, so was familiar with terminology and the billing software that is used at our cancer center. From a health system context, Shadowing was the most important aspect of on-the-job training. As we discussed previously, it was important for the financial counselor to be able to easily interface with the treating oncology team, financial office, navigator, and specialty pharmacist. At times, the financial counselor might even identify a need that would be better served by one of the other team members. Finally, two valuable resources for our financial counselor during training were the Association of Community Cancer Centers Financial Advocacy Boot Camp, which is a series of online modules that lead to certificates of completion with post-activity assessment, and the advisory board, which has several research reports that provide examples of real-world financial navigation programs and provides frameworks to help with various aspects of implementation. Because we brought on the financial counselor as part of our OCM program, the financial counselor was initially integrated into the OCM workflow. OCM patients included eligible Medicare beneficiaries who were receiving an initiating cancer therapy treatment and had at least one outpatient evaluation and management service for a cancer diagnosis during the episode. Each episode began with the trigger drug claim and then lasted for six months. In addition, the financial counselor could receive healthcare team referrals outside of the OCM workflow if there was a specific financial need identified either by the patient or the healthcare team that the financial counselor could assist with. Here's a swim lane diagram for the general workflow of our OCM program, and the financial counselor swim lane is highlighted in red. Here I've adapted the swim lane for the financial counselor into a larger flow chart so that it can be better visualized. So once the care team places an order for an infusion treatment, this automatically triggers a task for the financial counselor. The financial counselor then confirms the patient's insurance coverage. Using a patient to payment revenue cycle program, the financial counselor can enter payer or payers and the prescribed drug code to obtain an estimated out-of-pocket cost specific to that patient. The financial counselor is also able to see how much the patient has paid to date. Next, the financial counselor mails a patient, which includes a, or a patient letter which includes an insurance benefit summary and the out-of-pocket cost estimate. I'll share this letter with you in the next slide. The financial counselor then calls the patient to explain available financial counselor services and review the contents of the patient letter. The financial counselor asks if the patient has any concerns related to costs. If so, the financial counselor looks for potential financial assistance that is available either for the cancer diagnosis or the prescribed treatment and helps complete the application. If successful, the financial counselor notifies the patient and the financial office. Here on the right side, if there's a different concern or no available financial assistance program, the financial counselor helps to facilitate barrier resolution by referring to a navigator, social worker, or the financial office. Here at the bottom, you can see the financial counselor documents all of the actions in the electronic medical record and makes a plan to call the patient in follow-up to ensure the cost concern was adequately addressed. Here is the letter that is mailed to each patient. The first section provides information about the availability of the financial counselor to help patients understand their insurance benefits and assist with any financial questions or concerns. In the 
addition, it emphasizes that financial counselors have access to a variety of programs that can help with drug and copay costs if the patient qualifies. The next section of the letter focuses on providing education on insurance terminology such as annual deductible, coinsurance, annual out-of-pocket maximum, and copayment. Financial counselor then fills out the patient-specific total deductible and out-of-pocket maximum, as well as the amount met to date toward both of these thresholds. You can see the boxes here. On the left, it says your deductible met to date, and the total deductible um, are the top two boxes. Bottom two boxes are your out-of-pocket maximum met to date and the total. Um, and it does clarify below whether the copays apply to the out-of-pocket maximum and whether the deductible applies um, to the out-of-pocket maximum. Then at the bottom, the letter provides the phone contact information for our financial counselor. The last section of the patient letter is the out-of-pocket cost estimate for each infusion treatment for the prescribed chemotherapy drug or drugs. A disclaimer is included that explains that this is a good faith estimate based on the best information known and provided at the time of the estimate. In addition, the letter mentions other planned or unplanned expenses that patients may experience, such as those for transportation, parking, diagnostic tests, lab tests, office visits, and prescriptions, which are not included in this out-of-pocket estimate. Here I wanted to share a few screenshots of the documentation system within our electronic medical record. The first form is entitled Payer Benefit Coverage Investigation and Confirmation. This focuses on entering the patient's specific prescribed chemotherapy and insurance information and contains all of the information that is communicated in the mailed patient letter that I just showed you. The second form is entitled Oncology Financial Assistance for Chemotherapy. Here, the financial counselor documents referral source, patient's financial concerns, if any, insurance information, and whether the patient is eligible for patient assistance programs. The last action, section is to track actions taken, such as applying for financial assistance programs, and whether the application is successful or not. The financial counselor can also document other actions taken, such as mailing a letter, referring to another healthcare team member, reviewing insurance benefits, scheduling follow-up contact, or mailing our patient satisfaction survey. This system allows us to continually track the financial counselor's touch points and outcomes within the workflow. Here's data from our first year's experience. During this time, the financial counselor interfaced with 157 patients, either from the described OCM workflow, which accounted for 85% of the interactions, or healthcare team referrals, which accounted for the other 15%. The average age for these patients was 68 years old, 60% were female, 25% were black, and the average annual household income was approximately $30,000 for the patient who provided this information. Nearly all patients, 92% had Medicare Part D, and 77% had secondary insurance. We enhanced electronic medical record documentation approximately, approximately midway through the first year when we realized we needed better tracking mechanisms. After this time, the financial counselor documented 77 contacts. The majority of contacts were by mail, followed by phone, in person, and then email. The financial counselor documented 72 actions which included submitting copay applications for 27 patients, of which 23 were approved. So we're nearing the close to the last two sections of our talk, so we just wanted to check if you're still with us, if you don't mind entering your response to the Mentimeter. All right, happy to see at least most of the respondents are responding yes. Partially, good. Honesty is good. Thank you all for your attention. The next section hopefully also will keep your attention because we're really going to talk about some of the practical lessons that we learned from our um, lessons learned. So as I described, we quickly learned that it was necessary to develop a method to integrate the financial counselor's tasks and actions into the electronic medical record. We are continually modifying the form with the assistance of information technology services as we improve our clinical workflows. One important point is that it's not only important to have the information within the electronic medical record, 
but it needs to be able to be downloaded regularly and easily in a usable fashion, which is something we're actually still working on. As you may have noticed, the workflows I have described focus on infusion chemotherapy. It's also important to have a workflow in place for oral cancer drugs, as these are being increasingly utilized in oncology and are often associated with high drug costs. At our cancer center, the specialty pharmacist takes the lead on assisting patients with information on their pharmaceutical benefits, which are separate from patients' medical benefits, determining the estimated out-of-pocket cost, and helping patients to access oral drug financial assistance programs. We also observe that certain patient groups, such as those with Medicare or Medicaid, may not be eligible for as many assistance programs, particularly those from pharmaceutical manufacturers. Next, it's important as the financial navigation services evolve to ensure appropriate resource allocation from a personnel and time standpoint and to align consistent services across service lines and ultimately regardless of payer status. For us, this was an important next step as the financial counselor was initially embedded within the OCM program, but now it's being expanded for all patients. Ultimately, tracking the financial return to the institution through payment plans, improved insurance coverage, or accessing financial assistance programs can help make the business case for a practice or cancer center to hire or retain a financial counselor. Finally, it's important to build in multiple access points to account for changing patient needs and the spectrum of patient revenue costs. Our last objective is to review implications for future clinical and research efforts to improve financial navigation services. Clearly, like Veronica mentioned, the COVID-19 pandemic has had a very significant impact on cancer care delivery. There are certain implications that I wanted to briefly discuss. First, our financial counselor has already noticed decreased availability of financial assistance programs overall during this time. Second, COVID-19 has definitely had an impact on patient and caregiver employment and income in addition to the stressors that come along with the cancer diagnosis and treatment. American Cancer Society recently conducted a survey of over 3,000 cancer patients and survivors to assess the impact of COVID-19 on cancer care. They found that 40% of participants reported a notable financial impact on their financial situation, affecting their ability to pay for care. Financial issues that were reported including redu included reduced work hours, reduced investment values, difficulty affording food or supplies to stay at home, and loss of a job. 40% of paid participants also reported they or a family household member lost a job with employer-sponsored health insurance. On a more positive note, there has been rapid uptake of telehealth visits where appropriate, which may have the benefit of decreasing patients' non-medical costs for treatment related to transportation and time spent on their cancer care. Lastly, I would like to share our ongoing and future directions. Currently, like I mentioned, we are in the midst of expanding our financial counselor services beyond the OCM population to all patients across all cancer service lines. We are utilizing a combination of lay and nurse navigation at new patient intake to transfer referrals to the financial counselor. In addition, we are planning to pilot universal financial distress screening, comparing it to the information that is already being obtained from the NCCN distress thermometer screening to determine if this adds value to our patient care model. Clearly, it was a first step for us to provide out-of-pocket cost estimates for infusion chemotherapy, but we would like to be able to provide more comprehensive cost estimates beyond drug costs only. Finally, other areas that we feel could enhance our financial counselor services would be to provide training for our financial counselor to more adequately address employment concerns, caregiver financial distress, and education on financial skills such as budgeting. Thank you very much for your time and attention. I would like to acknowledge the following individuals for their leadership and contributions to the Financial Counseling Initiative at our Cancer Center and the entire UAB Oncology Care Model team. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Lang, for the wonderful presentation. Um, I do have a question to get the Q&A session started. Um, can you clarify when your financial distress screening began? Was it at the beginning of treatment or diagnosis? And if treatment, why not diagnosis? 
That's a great question. So right now, um, all of the cancer service lines are doing the NCCN distress thermometer, which many of you may be um, familiar with, but I'll just briefly describe. So it is a thermometer that goes on a scale of zero to 10, where patients indicate their distress level, zero being none, 10 being the highest. Um, and then it has a pretty thorough um, section for patients to mark off what specific things are causing them the distress. So examples would be physical side effects of treatment. Others would be practical concerns, which are a lot of the ones that financial hardship or distress would fall into. So challenges with transportation, affording medications or treatment, that. Um, other ones are emotional or sort of, um, you know, depression, anxiety, talking to family members, et cetera. So it's pretty comprehensive, although you can see that it's not focused specifically on financial distress. So that's being done at the time of diagnosis um, and starting treatment. Um, and then in our own, I'm a GYN oncologist, so I know in our own clinic, we have a screening question that's asked every um, time a patient comes for an appointment that asks if they have any difficulty affording their medication. Um, so that's asked frequently, but you can see that that, you know, is really focused only on medications and how that can be altered to help patients financial burden, but really doesn't expand to all the other, both me direct medical costs, um, costs that are still directly related to cancer care. Um, so we're sort of proposing potentially to use the cost score which has been validated in research studies, but has not been widely adapted in the clinical setting, um, and potentially using it not only at diagnosis, um, but also anytime a patient is starting a new line of therapy. Okay, great. I was gonna ask whether or not it was just a one-time screening or was screening continued throughout treatment? Yeah, and I think I think that's a great question um, and certainly an area since there were a lot of researchers on the line that I think we don't know the answer to. Um, a, how frequent do we need to survey patients because clearly survey burnout is a real thing both for patients and you know the staff members that are conducting the screenings but also we know you know probably screening there's some data that screening up front is important but then what is the follow-up aid to ensure resolution and also catch the patients that may develop issues later um, once they've experienced more of the cost of their treatment. Do you guys also screen for um, cancer patients having multiple chronic conditions also that they would have to manage and have to pay for uh, treatment? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I know in the um, sort of the lay slash nurse navigator that we are is being developed and developed and implemented. Essentially, every patient is getting a lay navigator, um, and then we're using a risk score um, that was developed at the Mitchell Cancer Institute in Mobile, Alabama, where which does actually include things like comorbidities. Um, so I think that's where it's being factored in, as well as stage of cancer. You know, the things you think of stage of cancer, um, of whether it's multimodal therapy or not things like having an ostomy as an example, so things where patients might have you know, higher utilization or need more exercise, et cetera, or care. Um, and so patients who screen into the high risk based on the scoring system then actually get a nurse navigator um, who works with a lay navigator. Um, and then we're trying to implement, again, sort of screening through that flow in order to increase the total number of referrals of patients who may benefit um, from financial navigation services, essentially. So I think that's where it's built into our current work, or it's being built into our current work. So that's a good point about really it's not always just the cancer diagnosis and treatment it can be also managing the medical comorbidities. True. Um, thank you for that. Um, also, was curious: was this implemented in the GYN service line? study? Um, no, so this was all okay. patients regardless of um, cancer type. So they just basically okay. need to be a Medicare beneficiary. Um, Got it. Okay. okay, because I was wondering why, if it was, why we only had 59% 
And then what about the 77% of um, those that were screened um, having secondary insurance? Um, I would think that that would be a, a nice safety gap insurance. Yeah, so um, when I showed the patient characteristics just from our first year experience, it's really not surprising that a lot of them had, since they were all Medicare beneficiaries, a lot of them had Medicare Part D, which covers um, or your prescription drugs. Um, and then a high proportion, like you noted, did have supplementary insurance. Um, I definitely think we all know that is probably a protective insurance factor, but I do think the point um, of regardless of that, there is still a lot of underinsurance, um, whether it's because the, you know, the non quote unquote medical costs that are still being required of the patient, both in terms of money and time that they're spending on cancer care are really not being accounted for and are really not at all covered by insurance. So I think that that just sort of understates the point that really we need to identify not only patients who are uninsured, which you know would, would be like a traditional model, um, but patients who may be struggling with other things that the patient may not even be aware of, A, that there are resources, or B, that there's an issue really until they get into crisis. So being a lot more proactive. Um, I had one last question. What was it? Um, do you know of any studies that have measured the relationship between uh, financial hardship and mortality? I think, um, so there are ones in non-cancer um, by Dr. Tucker. He's a little bit older. And then the main one that I'm aware of in the cancer field would be um, I apologize, I don't know the author off the top of my head, but basically they took um, Washington State bankruptcy data um, and then also looked at a cancer database and were able to link them. So they did find that patients who filed for bankruptcy that were cancer patients had over, you know, I think it was like a two times increased cancer mortality specifically. So. Clearly, bankruptcy is a pretty extreme form of financial hardship, although we do know that cancer is a much higher risk for developing bank, uh, bankruptcy in their medical class. So that's the main literature that I've seen related to mortality specifically. There's a lot of um, there's growing data, I guess, at adherence to treatment, and I would say really particular, in particular with oral cancer therapies. Um, as they're also very expensive and um, patients may actually have higher cost sharing potentially unless they are able to access financial assistance programs. So there's growing really higher patient cost sharing for oral cancer therapies leads to decrease in health, which we would then, you know, worry that that could have a negative impact on patients' clinical outcomes. Right. Thank you for that. If you don't mind sending me that citation later, I would appreciate it. Okay, so I would like to share with the group um, an NCI funding opportunity announcement um, that our participant researchers might be interested in responding to. Uh, at NCI, we're interested in receiving research grant applications to improve interprofessional teamwork and coordination during cancer diagnosis and treatment. And you can Google uh, the funding opportunity announcement, NOT-CA. Uh, dash 19 dash 059 to retrieve the full announcement or you can contact Dr. Sally Weaver or myself if you're interested uh, in applying. Our next and final session on financial hardship is on August the 27th and our presenter is our own Dr. Janet DeMore who will be presenting on current approaches for addressing medical financial hardship in the context of cancer care delivery. And so we hope that you'll be able to join us again on August the 27th. And the registration link is at the bottom of the slide, healthcaredelivery.cancer.gov forward slash cyber seminars. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Ling, for your great presentation. And um, we are going to end a little bit early so that you can have time to um, respond to the post session participant um, questionnaire. We really would appreciate your feedback so that we can use that information to improve uh, future uh, webinars. And we know that um, during the time of telework, a lot of people are 
participating in a lot of uh, conference calls and webinars, and so we want to give you a little bit more time uh, to get to your next session. So again, thank you everyone uh, for participating, and we hope you have a great rest of your day. And